This is a series called Voices from the Movement, um, different speakers uh, representing different aspects of democratic reform from all across Canada, coast to coast to coast. Um, Kevin, I've made you an admin, by the way. So if you see anyone who wants to join, I'll try, I'll try and stay on top of it. But if you notice as well, let me know. Um, or just, just let them in. Uh, our first session was uh, two weeks ago with Desmond Cole. Um, tonight we have Duff Conacher um, from an amazing group called Democracy Watch, which was established in 1993. Um, I was in grade 13 at the time, um, totally clueless about any of this stuff. Um, and it's inspiring to know that folks who were working on it back then um, have lived to tell the story and are still are still working on it now. Because uh, burnout, it's very easy to lose hope sometimes in this work. Um, so Duff, Duff is an inspiration because he's been uh, in the trenches for, for quite a long time doing amazing work. Democracy Watch has engaged more than 44,000 people through their online network. Um, you should check out the website. I'm going to be sending links out tomorrow. You don't have to take notes tonight. You don't have to copy and paste things from the chat or scribble down lists that are going to come out of Duff's mouth and brain. Uh, I will be sending you resources by email tomorrow, um, including a lot of links to Duff's website. Um, Duff and Democracy Watch have won more than 180 changes to laws, both provincial and federal that relate to democratic reform, both in terms of how governments act and how corporations act, um, which is an unbelievable number. Like, I'm really proud of the fact that I've maybe changed two laws. It might actually just be one. And, and I think that one got reversed three years later. So I think I'm back down to zero. And here's Duff with 180. Um, his website is like an encyclopedia of democratic ideas broken down into categories and lists and sublists. You could spend weeks on his website learning about opportunities for reform in Canada, but it's also set up in a way that you could skim it in a few minutes and kind of get ideas in a nutshell. It's amazing. So for example, they have a list right now of 100 key changes for democratic good government, which is again, mind blowing. I think I'm focused on maybe four or five right now plus 15 key changes to enact Canada's, to ensure that Canada's big banks and businesses act responsibly. And if you don't have time to read 115 changes, they have an amazing webpage called 20 Steps Towards a Modern Working Democracy, which has five steps to empower us as voters, four steps to empower Canadians as citizens, four steps to empower us as taxpayers, two steps to empower us as consumers of information and services, and five more steps to empower us as shareholders of private and public wealth. But tonight we're gonna to make it even simpler. Tonight Jeff is gonna walk us through four categories of reform. How to make businesses and government more open, honest, ethical, and representative. Very simple. Again, don't write that down. Everything's coming, you, everything is coming to you tomorrow via email. Just sit back like you're watching a movie and just try and mentally absorb um, what Duff is saying, but also just his energy, because I can't send that via email. Um, try and spiritually absorb um, the stories and the ideas that Duff is gonna share with us over the next hour. So with that, I wanna pass it over to Duff. I'm gonna start Duff with, by just asking you one or two really broad questions about your work. And then I'm gonna kind of just pass the mic over to you because you're a walking encyclopedia of this stuff. I just want you to give you a platform to just get ideas out about what you're working on now. And we'll wrap up the session with uh, questions from all of you, but also just focusing really specifically on what people can do to help you with your work, how they can get involved, how they can support you through emails, letter writing, donating to your work, et cetera. But my first question is, is really simple. I wanna start as broad as possible. How are you feeling emotionally after decades of work on a topic that often feels um, depressing and often feels that we're sometimes even losing ground? How do you remain optimistic and what gets you out of bed every day to keep doing the important work that you've been doing for decades in Canada? Sure, thank, thank you, Dave. Uh, for that very generous 
introduction and uh, also thank you for everyone taking the time out of I'm sure busy lives to uh, attend this session this evening and for anyone who's watching afterwards online. Um, well, I had a very great mentor in Ralph Nader, uh, who I did an internship with, with now um, 35 years ago or so, for a couple of years down in Washington as part of Nader's Raiders. And he always just reminded me, you're one person and you're chipping away at a system that has self-reinforcing elements to maintain power for the elite and uh, reduce accountability and protect people from accountability. So you're just chipping away. And so that's, I, I think uh, one of the important things is to have uh, realistic expectations about what's winnable. And another thing that he said was, the window usually opens for change once every five years, if you're lucky, often only once every 10 years. And you have to be ready at that time to really push tire tirelessly, even though you'll be really tired. There's no such thing as a tireless advocate, I don't think. Um, lots of them are really tired, although they may be described as tireless. And you have to push those times because the window will close again. Why does the window open? A crisis, uh, a party decides this is the way to win an election because voters are leading in that direction, a scandal, just like one form of crisis, and that causes a response. But as we'll talk about uh, in terms of honest government, what usually results is more spin. One of my father's favorite sayings was, when all is said and done, more is said than done. And that definitely applies to politicians and government officials in most situations. And so um, you're going to try to win a whole bunch, probably won't win 100%. And they'll try and spin it as if everything has been cleaned up and everything's wonderful and fine in whatever issue or problem you're working on. And then the media kind of turns away and the public thinks, has read the headlines that often say government changes this, government addresses this, solves this problem, and then takes five to 10 years to document again that it hasn't been solved and for the media to turn back their attention towards it and the public as well, led by the media coverage often. Social media is making that more open now in terms of the voices that can be heard, but still it's a struggle and to reach enough people after a change uh, session has happened where something has changed, even if it's not very much. So you just have to remind yourself, those are the realities of how things work. And uh, if you remind yourself, you're one person. Uh, Demarc Suwach, Dave has been saying his and he a lot, but actually we work in coalition. That's how we win, uh, working with trying to get as many organizations to join the cause. Strength in numbers always is very key to winning. And why do I keep doing this? Because I really believe if this stuff is solved, if there is democratic good government and democratic good business, and the rules are strong and they're strictly and strongly enforced that because those good processes of decision making will result in better decisions for more people and for the environment and protecting communities and and society as a whole so that's why i work on this issue and still have a passion for it after now 30 years because uh i think it it will wins in this area help everyone win who are concerned about whatever issue whatever societal problem that's a perfect segue to my second question, because I, I connect the dots in the same way you do. When I think about what can we do about climate change, I think about democratic reform. To me, everything flows back to the processes we use to collectively make decisions about the world around us. Um, to me, like if, to me, the most crucial movement in Canada is the movement for democratic reform because it affects everything else, yet we are one of the smallest movements. So if you look at how many groups are out there with tons of staff and big budgets working on climate change or, or you know, lots of other issues, and I'm not complaining, good for them, that's amazing, 
Um, but you've, you know, in the environment, you've got Greenpeace, Sierra Club, Suzuki Foundation, amazing. And then you look at our sector and it's like, you know, there's your group and my group and you got Fair Vote and Samara doing research, but like we could all, we could all fit in my living room. So why do you think we've had trouble um, getting a message out that if you care about other urgent issues, you should also be thinking about the details of decision-making processes and these four issues about how we can make governments and corporations more open, honest, ethical, and representative. Why are we relatively a fringe movement? I think the number one reason is it's abstract. Um, these are processes. There's no great pictures. We tried to come up with one that's behind me now. <laughs> Um, it's hard. What are the what are the pictures? Words, um, but you know, environmental movement. You have big trees get, getting cut down. You have little cute animals getting hit over the head, and you go through all the other issues. And there's great photos that tug at the hearts of lots of people for good reason. Secondly, all of these groups working on any substantive issue are working for democratic reform. They're always working for more representative decision making. Uh, they're often pointing out statements and actions by government secrecy. They're trying to find out big businesses that are lobbying on the other side and anything about the, the force of corporations pushing against citizen interests. Uh, they're also pointing, looking for scandals and ethics in terms of political donations. So people can support a group that's they care about the environment or kids or health care or social welfare, social justice, economic justice. And they know that group is also pushing somewhat for democratic reform. Um, third, uh, we have the NDP and the US doesn't have that third part of the Greens are certainly trying uh, and having some success, especially at the local level there. But having a third party that uh, focuses uh, at least in name on democracy uh, and we have a fourth of the Greens and the Bloc Québécois has been a leader on political finance. So people see parties as an outlet as well for their concerns and the parties uh, do some of this work, certainly not enough. And they always resist increasing their own accountability, hoping to get in power themselves uh, and spin and be secretive and reward their friends and do secret deals with lobbyists as much as the other parties, but there is some outlet there. So I think those are the three reasons. Foundations as well, environment was first to be designated as a charitable cause that is really a, an advocacy area, healthcare as well. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of charitable money flows to those two big, big areas uh, and they don't have much left over. And when you're challenging democracy, you're challenging the power elite and how they exercise their power. Yeah. A lot of our foundations in Canada have people from the power elite on the boards. They are family foundations from the elite sectors of society. They often have senators on the boards or other politicians uh, because the elite is, is, despite the size of our country, a pretty small group of people. So add up all those things and you don't end up with a lot of money and funding to reach out to a lot of Canadians. And they have these other outlets through other groups and, and parties as well. Cool. Um, the good thing is, though, yep, go ahead. The good thing is, in every poll, uh, right back to uh, the late uh, 1980s, every poll that's been done has shown that 80% of people want these reforms. So it doesn't matter what groups they're involved in. Every politician knows that if another party says we're going to clean things up, that it's a, it's automatically an election issue, because swing voters look for better government. They know that they're not going to get their concerns addressed unless government decision making is open, honest, ethical, and representative. And so they will swing to a party uh, that uh, makes those promises and makes them in a big way. Mm -hmm. And they have. They swung in 93 to the Chrétien Liberals, who promised much more again when all is said and done, more said than done. 2006 to the Harper Conservatives, 2015 to the Trudeau Liberals. And if you look across every provincial election since 93, you'll see the same pattern. The party that promises cleaning up politics highlights it, makes it serious, either yeah. wins more seats or wins the election. And there was even a party that 
took uh, reform so seriously that they called themselves the Reform Party and Indeed. ended up also being quite also, influential in Canadian history. Yes, and also in 93, because they really highlighted that issue. Uh, yeah, huge. Also had a, won uh, many more seats, became the official opposition. Yeah, after. I mean, I was a teenager then. I wasn't even paying attention to politics, and I knew about this Reform Party, um, you know, trying to shake things up uh, for better or worse. I didn't agree with all of their social policies, but I was aware that they were also questioning the way the parliament worked and, uh, yes. you know, Tripoli Senate and all of that. Um, okay, let's dive into the four general themes that we're going to touch on tonight. Um, and I'd like to remind everyone that you can put, um, you can put your questions um, in the chat and we'll try and get to them uh, afterwards. And uh, for each of these sections, Duff, if you can, obviously explain what this theme is about. If you can give us an example of like a, a, a good victory you've had in the past, and then an example of something you're hoping to win or secure in the near future, um, that would be awesome. So going back to our list, let's start with how we can make government and corporations more open. Over to you. Great, so the reason I'm starting with openness is because openness also gets you in somewhat uh, indirectly, honesty and ethics and representation. Secrecy is a recipe for corruption, waste and abuse of the public. And so if government is fully transparent, then uh, you're going to have more representative and honest decisions because all the information that voters is being hidden from voters because the politicians don't want them to know it because they have a different agenda. All the secret lobbying is uh, exposed. Uh, so just as a cat, you never end, as you see on the movies always, those meetings in the underground parking lots or on the back nine of golf courses. Really impossible to end those, uh, even with a really strong lobbying, transparent lobbying law and, and enforcement. Uh, but you can certainly make those illegal without it being recorded and disclosed. Uh, and then um, also in terms of donations and the influence of donations and gifts, if there's full transparency on that, then uh, that helps in the ethics area as well. And then whistleblower protection, which is part of transparency, part of accountability as well, where anyone who is in government or involved in any way connecting with politicians, uh, working as their staff, uh, working as contractors, if they have a place to blow the whistle and wrongdoing, you also get uh, some waste prevention, more ethical decision making. So honest uh, openness gets you, gets you a lot in the other areas, not everything, which is why some reforms are also needed more directly in those other areas. Uh, what do we have now in Canada? Well, it's either called an Access to Information Act or sometimes a Freedom of Information Act across the country. And really, those laws should be called the guide to hiding information that the public has a right to know. They are loophole filled. Uh, and those they're actually in some ways more loophole than they are law. And they allow for excessive government secrecy. There is a case for government secrecy in a few areas. Government gathers a lot of information about individuals. And that's your personal private information that you're required to give to the government and others should not be able to look at it. Uh, police gather lots of information when investigating, as does any law enforcement agency. And you, if, if uh, people violating the law were able to file an access to information request and say, I want to know the state of the investigation and have you tap my phone, et cetera, then obviously that would undermine investigations. National security is the same. Uh, we have uh, people who are uh, threatening the national security of Canada in some ways. And if, again, the spy agencies had to disclose all the information about who their spies are and everything they're doing, uh, that would be hurt. And international relations. Uh, there are a lot of frank discussions that happen in governments about other governments and uh, sometimes insulting. And if all that was disclosed, it could hurt international relations in an unintended way. Uh, but there are far more loopholes than that, and there always needs to be a public interest override in those areas. And uh, we need to ensure that 
uh, they, they, none of those uh, areas are, is entitled in terms of law enforcement to complete uh, secrecy because that's a recipe always for waste, corruption, and abuse. So there always needs to be strong enforcement, and we'll talk about that uh, after talking about the other areas. Lobbying, secret lobbying is legal. You might have heard of a five-year ban on at the federal level after you leave office, five-year ban on lobbying. No, it's a five-year ban on a, uh, the prime minister, cabinet minister, other top government official leaving office and doing registered lobbying. But there are loopholes in the lobbying law that allow for unregistered lobbying. So it's actually legal for the prime minister and cabinet ministers to leave office and the next day lobby the government. They have to be careful for a couple of years about who they lobby, but it's actually they can lobby the government the day after they leave and be paid for it and not have to register it. So it's in secret. Uh, obviously, that's unethical lobbying too. Uh, political finance. Uh, we have pretty good donation disclosure, but not all, all donations are disclosed. Donations under $200 are not disclosed. And so that facilitates a company walking into uh, uh, party headquarters and giving checks for $199 from all their employees, all their 1,000 employees. And the party might take the money, even though it's illegal to be giving donations on someone else's behalf, but it's all secret. So it's going to be a recipe for that kind of corruption as long as the secrecy is allowed. So those are the major areas of openness, but, and you can see how each of them help with honest, ethical government as well, and even representative decision-making if those loopholes were all closed and we actually had transparent government. Are there any specific um, reforms that are low-hanging fruit or there's a private member's bill, like anything on the move right now that looks like it's within reach in that area? Uh, the federal government is doing a review of the Access to Information Act currently. Okay. Uh, so there's opportunity to press on that. And Dr. Watch has an open government campaign. And there's a new network called the Right to Information Alliance Canada of groups that is uh, coming together to push more for that. And uh, so that's an area we'll, where we'll hopefully get some reform. Uh, but there were no promises from the Liberals in the 2021 election in any of these areas. Uh, so it's not certainly on their agenda. Uh, the review is happening because like a lot of le federal laws, they are required to be reviewed every five years. And that's an opening that's built into our system, thankfully, uh, that isn't there, for example, in the U.S. system, so that these reviews have to happen. A committee has to hold hearings, a committee of the House uh, or the Senate, and it's an opportunity to raise the issue, and the media usually covers it a bit, and that's what's happening now. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have some review of, of uh, the lobbying law is overdue in terms of its review. It was supposed to be reviewed in 2017, every five years. Now it's 2022, five years later. So it's going to have to be reviewed soon as well. And we're pushing for review of the whistleblower protection law. And then provincially, um, there are reviews happening at various times. It would be too long to go through the list of what's on the agenda of all the provinces. Uh, but Democracy Watch usually tries to intervene on uh, on those as as we have the resources to do as well Sweet. so lots of areas to push for um, there'll be a review likely of the election law and political donations as soon as the elections canada chief electoral officer reports on the uh how the 2021 election went and the donations and other problems might might have come out of that that have been highlighted by the 2021 election all right cool thanks duff um second theme of the night Honesty. This is a funny one because, you know, we often hear this kind of joke, I guess you could say, or, uh, or sad fact that, you know, anyone is allowed to complain about a company lying in an ad, but we don't have a similar mechanism if a politician lies in a campaign or a campaign ad. So how do you regulate honesty? Well, we actually do have a rule in our Canada Elections Act uh, and in a few of the provincial laws. Uh, it's strangely worded. It's uh, ancient wording uh, from like 150 years ago. You're not allowed to induce a voter to vote for you as a candidate or a party or other entity uh, if you by any pretense or contrivance. Wow. So that essentially means false claim. If you look it up in the dictionary. Okay. Um, 
And uh, Democracy Watch filed a complaint after uh, Trudeau broke his promise to change the electoral system. Right. Uh, the promise made in the 2015 election about 2,000 times by Trudeau with no conditions on it at all. And he then said, well, you know, there isn't consensus and that's why I'm not going to do it. But he never said, I won't do it if there's no consensus. He said, I'm going to do this unequivocally. Uh, the, the commissioner for Canada elections said, well, that was meant to prevent fraud where um, there's a fraudulent intent. And that's because the BC law has the same words uh, and it says you can't fraudulently by any pretense or contrivance induce a voter to vote for you. But the federal law doesn't have the word fraudulently in there, so it was the wrong decision. There's no fraud needed at the federal level. You just can't make a false claim to induce a voter to vote for you. But you can't appeal a prosecutor who the Commissioner of Canada Elections was deciding whether to prosecute Trudeau, and that's, that cannot be appealed to the courts. Uh, the rule is that prosecutors get to decide who to prosecute. So we couldn't appeal that to the courts, even though it was clearly the wrong decision. And so now that rule has to be changed. And it just has to say by any false claim, fraud is not needed so that this commissioner won't keep dodging and failing to do his job properly and let people off the hook for what was actually fraud. You know, Trudeau fraudulently misled voters. <laughs> So uh, hopefully we'll get that rule changed. There is some pressure on uh, to do that. It's actually coming out of the social media area. Politicians are really concerned about misinformation right now, about themselves. <laughs> so they're looking to federally try and make misinformation much more difficult on the, on the uh, internet, on social media sites. But they're not gonna be, well, they could, always exempt themselves from that rule, uh, but hopefully they won't if they actually tackle this area. Lots of people are concerned about that, um, about censorship, about dissent being suppressed, where people are just expressing an opinion. But if the law is drafted properly, I think we can ban false claims by anyone during elections. It's not freedom of expression. You're not expressing an opinion, a thought, a belief. You're making a false factual claim. I'm even happy if the wording was blatantly false claims. Let's start with that because right. there's a bunch of them every day coming out of Parliament Hill, not just from the ruling party, but then the counterspin from the opposition parties that is often misleading as well. Right. It's a fundamental voter rights issue. You cannot be an informed voter as long as dishonesty is allowed because you can learn all the platforms of all the parties backwards and forwards, but you know some of those promises are lies. And so you don't know which ones, and so you're essentially like you're playing poker and you're trying to figure out who's bluffing and how much they're bluffing and your money is on the table right. as a taxpayer, right? When you're voting and it's a fundamental voter rights issue and politicians don't want to talk about it. They want to continue this, but we've seen what happens. It's, it's already degrading in Canada. It's way past degraded in the U S and you cannot have a reasonable discussion if anyone's allowed to lie. It's impossible. If you cannot have a reasonable discussion, you cannot solve any problem in society. Right. Is there, there has is to be there, a sanction? Um, is, there a country, is there a country that's really leading on this where like you use the term banning false claims? Has, has this been done effectively some, somewhere? Are there are templates we could use. Um, uh, New Zealand. OK, cool. Put in place a rule. No false claims during elections. Wow. And uh, several U.S. states did as well. And then the court struck it down saying government should not be able to decide the truth. And I agree. And I can talk just a little bit about enforcement. We'll talk more later. None of the watchdogs on any of these areas can be chosen by the ruling party. They can't even be chosen by politicians. Right. We need something that, that Prime Minister Harper promised when he was first elected in 2006. We need a public appointments commission that is made up of uh, people that maybe all the parties will agree on but none of them can be tied to any of the parties. And in terms of donations or anything, independent people, uh, some say, well, let's do judges. Well, judges are actually chosen by the ruling party uh, in our system. Uh, and we're challenging, currently Democracy Watch has a challenge of the federal judicial appointment system because it's really under the control of a politician and cabinet and, and doesn't have the independence needed to ensure impartial courts. 
all the watchdogs are chosen in that same way. Um, some of them uh, really even in a worse, uh, more secretive way than the judges are chosen with no independence uh, scrutiny of candidates. And we need a, an independent appointments commission to choose all these people. And uh, then all of these watchdog agencies would be independent. It wouldn't be the hand of government saying there was a false claim. It would be a fully independent commission saying there's been a false claim here. It has to be taken down on social media and the misleader is going to pay a penalty of some fine. Uh, I really think it's an important issue. We, you can't be an informed voter without this. Yeah. And that's pretty fundamental to having a democracy is to have voters be able to make an informed vote. So let's move on to the next area, ethics. Ethics, yeah, all right. Not, not that honesty isn't part of ethics, of course it is. But when I'm talking about ethics, I mentioned that secret lobbying is legal before. Well, there's actually a lobbyist code at the federal level uh, and a rule in some of the laws, uh, like Ontario's lobbying law, that says you cannot uh, put a politician in the appearance of a conflict of interest. However, that only applies to lobbyists who are registered. So if you are an unregistered lobbyist because you're exploiting one of the loopholes, then you can fundraise for a politician you're lobbying, you can campaign for them, and right after they're elected, then back to lobbying them. So uh, it, you, you don't have ethical lobbying rules as long as you have loopholes in the transparent lobbying rules, because if you don't have to register your lobbying, then the ethics rules that apply to lobbyists won't apply to you. Uh, and we've seen this again and again at the federal level. Um, Barry Sherman, for example, head of Apotex, held a fundraising event in August 2015 for Trudeau. The Liberals raised $150,000 for the Liberals. And uh, because he was a board member of Apotex, and this happened with a couple other corporations, um, board members, um, it's, it's another uh, loophole in the lobbying area, board members, unless they're paid, do not have to uh, register because only unpaid lobbying has to be registered. Uh, sorry, only paid lobbying has to be registered, not unpaid lobbying. So that's another huge loophole that allows people to register without lobby without registering, and therefore the ethics rules don't apply to them. When businesses are lobbying about the enforcement of any law and lobbying the enforcement agency that enforces that law, they don't have to register their lobbying. So all that lobbying can be done in secret by anyone at the corporation, and then they can also fundraise for or campaign for or do favors or give gifts to po the politicians they're lobbying. Uh, so those loopholes are part of the ethics uh, area. The other big uh, loophole in ethics is across the country, every politician and top government official is allowed to profit from their own decisions. They're allowed to have secret investments in the shares of the companies that they are making decisions about. So the finance minister is able through a mutual fund to own shares in banks and be responsible for changing the bank act. Wow. Not only that, and that's secret. We're not allowed to know that the finance minister has the shares in the mutual fund. That's kept secret. In the US, it's disclosed. Members of Congress have to disclose their investments, but federally in Canada, they don't, and in most of the provinces. Wow. Um, they have to disclose it to a, a, a commissioner, an ethics commissioner, integrity commissioner, but it's not made public. And because of this loophole that it allows them to then take part in decisions that they profit from, the, the commissioner can't say to them, you have to sell those shares. It's legal. It's legal to be invested in companies that you make decisions about in Canada. So Bill Morneau was finance minister and owned $30 million of shares in Morneau Chappelle which is uh, part of its business is managing pensions. And Bill Morneau introduced a bill that if it had gone through, this was a few years back, if it had gone through, would have made Morneau Chappelle's business increase. And Morneau Chappelle, his family company would have profited and he would have profited given he owned 30 million shares mm -hmm. in the company at the time. In secret, no one knew that he owned these. So he was able to introduce a bill that he would have profited from and his family's company would have profited from. And it was uh, there. If you look back, you'll see the headline say no conflict of interest here. Ethics Commissioner rules on Morno situation. Right. There was a conflict of interest. Of course, there was. It was a financial conflict of interest. But under the Conflict of Interest Act, 
because of this, of this huge loophole, that is not considered to be a conflict of interest. The most serious conflict of interest that you can have across Canada, which is a financial conflict of interest where you will profit from your decisions, is defined in every conflict of interest law that applies to politicians and government officials as exempt from the definition of conflict of interest. That's how bad it is wow. in Canada. So uh, that's a huge area of ethics. Federal government employees and a lot of the employees of governments across the country who have far less decision-making power than politicians uh, in cabinet and the prime minister and premiers, they are actually required to avoid appearances of conflict of interest with no loopholes. So politicians have imposed this rule on the lowest level federal government employee while the most powerful politicians have the weakest rule. It's actually a system that is perverse, exactly the reverse of what it should be. And uh, that is the same across the entire country. So uh, if you're allowed to be in a conflict of interest and help your family, friends and associates when you're making a decision, and you're allowed to keep it secret that you have this conflict of interest, what do you think you're going to do? Again, it's a recipe for corruption, waste, and abuse. Right. So those are the three big areas. And if you clean those three up, you have transparent government. So it has to be more representative decision-making because everyone knows all the information that you had as a government, every, all the information you ignored, who lobbied you. Uh, they, you have to be honest, so you're going to make a more representative decision if you have to be honest, and you can't just spin it, especially if you're going to face a fine that's one year's salary if every time you mislead, it's supposed to lead. And ethical, if you can't be helping yourself and your friends and corporate lobbyists who are doing favors for you and giving you gifts in secret, then you're also going to be make more representative decisions. So these three areas, cleaning them up, gives you more representative government. Uh, and uh, they're, they're actually key to having more representative government. And so that's why I've started with them and ended with representation, because you get better representation through cleaning these three areas up. There are, of course, a few direct things that you want to do in terms of representation. And uh, I know people are probably going to think I'm going to say voting system reform first. Yes, that is one of the key. But there's another one, too. And it ties into the lobbying and the ethics and the transparency. And that is meaningful public consultation. We have this in a couple of areas uh, in law in Canada. The first one is uh, decisions that have an impact on the environment. And in almost every jurisdiction, there is an environmental assessment law that requires a meaningful public consultation on the impacts on the environment and that has to be taken into account in the decision. And it's all reported publicly, what people said. And there's an environmental assessment board that does a report as well. And all the submissions are made available. And because of that, a lot of decisions are stopped because they have an, a, an impact that enough voters don't want. And also that is illegal in, in depending on how the law is drafted. The other big area we have meaningful public consultation is in uh, labor laws with collective bargaining. Right. And so when governments decide on budgeting decisions with regard to uh, public employees, then they have to meaningfully consult through a collective bargaining process. Uh, and there's reports out about what the positions are on each and, and it is done behind closed doors, some of it, but uh, there are reports out to those who are concerned, who are the workers and they get to vote on it. Those are the only two areas. It doesn't make sense. Every law uh, and every decision of every government, we need, before it happens, a meaningful public consultation. You get bad decisions from quick decisions that are shoved halfway down voters' throats before they even know what the, it's happening. And, uh, and the media is trying to play catch up, but it's already done because the major decision has been made behind closed doors. So uh, meaningful public consultation, Sweden is really the model in this area. They use something called study circles and uh, it's government facilitated. They do it at every, every level of government. 
They have independent facilitation of small groups, study circles, of a representative sample of the population that's chosen just the way pollsters cho choose representative samples. So let's say 2,000 people in groups of 10 to 15. Right. And they will meet the multiple sessions. First session, let's learn about the issue. Maybe another session on that as well. Second, let's start looking at the questions that the government wants answered. And then the final sessions where people actually give input back, uh, either through you know writing out answers or um, some sort of closed system where the study circle uh, members are able to do something online and give feedback. Right. And that's all reported out publicly before the government makes the decision. So you combine that with meeting with stakeholder groups, which should all, again, if you have a transparent lobbying law, everyone knows what was said and who was there and what politicians were there and how many meetings and emails and phone calls took place for all the lobbyists, the stakeholder lobby groups, meeting with academic experts. They're not lobbying, but again, a transparency law would make that all public. Polls that the government does, all of those should be required to be made public. Um, and the laws across Canada are not strong enough on that. So now the government's going to do 10 polls, ask a question 10 different ways, and then release the one that gives them the best result that they want for their agenda. And then study circles. Citizen assembly is another way to go. Uh, I prefer study circles as a consultation method myself, because in a citizen assembly of 100 to 150 people, uh, one or two charismatic people can sway the whole crowd. Whereas if you have 100 groups of 20 people each, 50, or 200 groups of 10 people each, then one person can't sway that whole decision-making process with a charismatic presentation. So it's the same same general idea of using a random jury selection process, but decentralizing yes. it so you get more of an averaged opinion over multiple groups. That's right. This, this process is also called deliberative judgment processes. Um, but if you look up study circles, you'll see uh, Wikipedia, other sites have it. And Sweden, again, uses them at every level of government all the time for every issue. And so we should have a law that says if you are making a significant decision with some sort of threshold in terms of m amount of money spent, number of voters affected, you should be required to do a meaningful public consultation that is reported fully and publicly. So then everyone will know what the what most people want. And uh, it'd be very clear and, and you'll get more representative decisions from governments as well, because then they will have to defy a public report on what most people want. So uh, that's a key reform. You add all of these up <clears throat> and again, 80% plus of Canadians want all of these things and have told post pollsters that in every survey that has been done since 93. Okay, so coming up on 29 years. And wow. if you do all of those things, then voting system reform is still uh, very helpful in terms of getting a more representative parliament. But a more representative parliament does not mean necessarily that those people are going to make good decisions. You still need good decision-making processes, which means open, honest, ethical decision-making processes. And uh, that's why I highlight those three other areas. Um, Voting system reform as well, I think, needs a, more than just uh, bringing some proportionality and, and accuracy to voting results, uh, which is very important for social inclusion, for voters to feel that their vote counts yeah. and that therefore they are representative, uh, represented in any legislature. Uh, I also think that we should have a none of the above option at the end of every ballot. Yeah. Um, there's no danger in that, and uh, it's and our proposal as Democracy Watch is not only at the bottom would you put none of the above, but then on every ballot you'd have a couple of lines where you could write just a few words about why you're voting none of the above, and those would be uh, put together by the election agency and reported out with the election results. So let's say you know five percent of people will say vote none of the above, and half of those say because environmental platforms are not strong enough. Well, I think you'll see some parties falling over themselves to get two and a half percent more vote. And so it'd be a great feedback loop to politicians who are always wondering why people don't vote. And you know what we have now for determining why people don't vote? We have a survey of 2,000 people. And the first question is, did you vote? 
And always 15 to 20% more people say they voted than actually voted. <laughs> Which means that survey result is completely inaccurate. Right. Right. You'd have no idea from then on whether why people didn't vote. And and so we we can actually track every ballot and know who voted. And because it's tied into the tax system, um, have Elections Canada find out their age and income level and, and wealth. And why Elections Canada does not do that, I don't understand. Because we could get a completely accurate picture, 100% accurate picture of who voted uh, very easily with no invasion of privacy because when you go and vote you're crossed off they know you voted yeah it's not that your name would be reported out it's just instead of this survey of 2,000 people that's totally inaccurate uh for example in 2015 people say the, the youth vote went up an enormous amount we have no idea whether it actually did it was all based on a survey that right was with 15 to 20 percent inaccuracy rate right so we could know exactly who's voting their age income level uh and uh where they are and and it would be great to have that information for everybody including the parties in terms of trying to uh focus on voter turnout i, love uh, I really would hope i'm urging elections canada to to tap into that and actually uh do that report at post-election every election i love it i remember for my book i was researching which countries allow a none of the above option on their ballots and there was one example i loved where they actually had a rule that if none of the above won, then they, you'd have to have another election. And there was, yes. I think there was one example where, where that happened. The, the plurality vote was for none of the above. And of course, Brewster's Millions uh, is also a great example. Yeah, um, it wouldn't happen a lot. Um, but I think you need to give an outlet to people who are saying, no, I've looked at all the platforms. Yeah. And none of them, your vote is like a reference letter for right. something for a job, right? None of them deserve a reference letter for this job of a politician. Yeah. And uh, especially if you could get a, give a reason and that was reported out and the parties um, would that very closely. Duff, what's the, what's the name of the survey? We have a question from Mike Kenzie, that, that survey of 2,000 people. Elections Canada does it. Uh, Stats Can does a separate one, uh, has done not as regularly as Elections Canada. So Elections Canada commissions pollsters. You'll find it on their website. Okay, if cool. You look at uh, election, past elections, I think is the general tab and you'll see the surveys. And I will send out a link tomorrow that includes that. Um, we had a question from Vicky um, about how quickly um, candidates have to post uh, disclosure of donations because it's kind of useless if they disclose all the donations after election day. So she asked if there's any rules where, for example, her example was within five days of receiving the donation, you have to post it publicly. Is that happening anywhere? Because that sounds good to me. That's a that's a great uh, question, and I'm glad these kind of questions are filling in the gaps that I had to leave because I couldn't go through a hundred different changes <laughs> that we need. But this is an important one. So parties put in place uh, all agreed for leadership contestants in a party. Uh, and this was Jean Chrétien that did it, and the, but the others support, were supportive of it. And he was doing it really to, to reveal Paul Martin and how he had paid for his campaign to try and oust Chrétien um, that started in 2000 and ended when, when Chrétien left in 2003. Okay. And Paul Martin spent $2 million of his own money on that effort, which was legal back then. Uh, it was legal to donate that much. Uh, so what Chrétien put in was leadership candidates have to disclose one month before uh, or every month during a leadership campaign. And then during the last month, every week, all the donations they've received. Wow. And that's only in place for leadership candidates. It shouldn't be that way. It should be that way for every candidate and every party. Right now, the reports come across the country uh, for parties and candidates uh, four months after the election for parties, and they give candidates usually six months after. Wow. That's you, knowing, who bank, who, knowing who bankrolled each candidate in each party is essential. What a lot of people yeah. wouldn't realize is the federal parties and a lot of the provinces, their, their campaigns are bankrolled by financial institutions and uh, banks are allowed to uh, lend an unlimited amount of money and this is especially bad for, to federal candidates and federal uh, parties because banks are federally regulated. And so it's a huge favor they do. And almost every party runs on a loan at the federal level, a huge loan of tens of millions right. of dollars. 
So uh, voters should know that there should be headlines. You know, the liberals are running on a $30 million loan from this bank and that bank. And this candidate, all the local reporters can check their local candidates and find out who's bankrolling whom. But the real solution to ethical politics, and I didn't go into this as much as I should have, is to lower the donation limit. And we have a great example in Quebec. Quebec is a world leading jurisdiction now. You are only allowed to donate $100 to a candidate or a party in Quebec at the provincial level. And wow. if you donate more than $50, you have to send it to Elections Quebec, who verifies that it's your money. And it's not some business who's sending in a check on your behalf claiming that you, they are you as an employee of the business. And you can't donate in cash more than $20. And it's the world leading system. And it was came out of a crisis, a corruption crisis, the Charbonneau Commission people might have heard of, uh, where the correction, construction industry were bribing provincial and municipal politicians. And uh, it's a world leading system and it's right here in Canada. Uh, Globe and Mail is pushing for a hundred dollar donation limit. Uh, the average donation, Demarcy Wetch has done a study, the average donation level, the most accurate mm -hmm. indication of average donation that an average voter is giving in the last five years to every, every federal party, it's $75. So the donation limit should be no higher than that. Otherwise you're allowing people with wealth to uh, essentially use their wealth as a means of undemocratic unethical influence. So that's the real solution is, uh, and then you wouldn't really care about donation disclosure because no one's bankrolling significantly any candidate or party. I know uh, some, I, I think you yourself favor uh, uh, getting credits, everyone being given a, a little uh, tax bond that oh, they yeah. can donate. And the reason, yeah, voucher. yeah, and I think we should have that for people with low incomes, because even at a $75 donation limit, uh, yeah. that's a lot of money to uh, about 11% of the population that's living on less than $30,000 a household. Yeah, uh, but it shouldn't be for everybody. The party should have to chase after others for money, right? And uh, in order to prosper financially, and so that's why I favor a seventy-five donation limit, but on, and only a, a subsidy to that, uh, and public funding for those who really need it. Um, we've got a few more questions coming on the chat. Um, Harminder um, from Mississauga had a few uh, ideas about. Uh, increasing voter turnout, um, ideas that have been floated around like um, having elections um, uh, on a weekend instead of a weekday when people don't have to go to work and take their kids to school, um, maybe having some kind of lottery, I, I, I guess, where it's like a, every vote is a lottery ticket and you could, you could maybe win. Um, are there any, any ideas like that or others that, that you like in terms of uh, boosting electoral participation? Yes, um, and just so I know, it, it's uh, the screen is staying on you. If if oh. that is a concern at all, um, uh, for these other reforms, um, first of all, if you change the voting system to something more proportional, and I haven't gone into the multiple ways of doing that, um, and when we talk about how you win these things, uh, one thing I'll note is the difficulty of winning on that, that issue and, and the reasons why, and part of it is the multiple variations, whereas a, a, an access to information law, transparent lobbying law, these government ethics rules, there's consensus on, on all of these things and what the system should be, and 80% of Canadians want it a certain way, and even an honesty law, as long as the enforcement is fully independent, uh, Canadians want it. There's much more consensus on those. Um, if you change the voting system, though, to something that's more proportional, you have an honesty in politics law so that people can't be baited with false promises. You have a vote none of the above uh, system, and you clean up the ethics and the lobbying and the transparency systems in government. You are going to get a lot more voters. Right. Uh, I don't. I think our problem will be solved. You certainly don't need mandatory voting. And, and that would be unconstitutional and a violation of the charter right to vote, I think, unless you had the option to vote none of the above. Right. Uh, but uh, three days to vote, having voting days on weekends, all of those are great ideas. And if I can just say one other thing, 
in terms of sort of overall wrap up. I haven't talked a lot about the transparency, honesty, and ethics for corporations, but all of these same things apply only shifted to the corporate sphere. Uh, and as transparency, especially, it should be government requiring far more transparency and then making that part of the, the government information system where you can get this information about corporations. Uh, every single thing about them, their internal operations. They hide all sorts of fraud and waste and scandals because they're allowed to, if, unless it uh, affects a meaningful amount of their shares, 10% of their overall uh, revenue and or income. They're, they're not required under corporate law to disclose these things to shareholders. It's not considered meaningful and something that shareholders would take into account. They let all sorts of executives go who have been involved in scandalous behavior and they just retire them quietly. And so we have this false impression out there in society that corporations are more efficient than governments or, or uh, do things uh, more effectively, less waste, uh, run more ethically and things like that. And uh, you see those impressions just because of the level of corporate secrecy that's allowed. But in terms of uh, corporate ethics, the rules are actually uh, stronger in some ways. Uh, and uh, honesty, as you mentioned, corporations can't lie in an ad. Well, that, that rule, that law that uh, all the advertising uh, broadcasters have doesn't apply to political statements. Right. Um, corporations are not allowed to lie to their shareholders, corporate executives. Politicians should not be allowed to lie to voters. You know, we tell our kids honesty is the best policy, and yet we allow dishonesty as the policy in politics. Doesn't make sense. Right. Um, Andre um, pointed out when you were mentioning the Sweden study councils, oh, study circles, he pointed out that Sweden is often ranked as one of the top democratic countries in the world. And he related that to it being unicameral, which reminded me that I wanted to ask you a question about strategy and tactics, because I, I saw a web page on your site that said, shut down the Senate, which I think a lot of us agree with, probably even a lot of senators. Um, and of course, was policy for the conservatives. And I mean, it, it isn't really a radical idea, but some people would see it as a radical idea. When do you, when and how do you decide when you want to offer reforms to fix a certain part of the system? And when you think part of the system is just rubbish and just needs to go. So that specific page wasn't reform the Senate. It wasn't Triple E Senate. It was shut it down. I like that, um, even though I work for a senator. Um, when do you decide to go all in and, and just go bold? And when do you kind of hold back and work towards incremental changes? Well, uh, shut down the Senate also includes, if you look at the, uh, that page on Demarcy Watch's website, it includes reform the House to bring a lot of the elements of the Senate into the House. Uh, one is free MPs. MPs are under the control of their party leader. Right. They all hold an axe over their heads, which uh, Michael Chong, Conservative MP, tried to remove with the Reform Act, but it turned into the hope for, for Reform Act because not enough MPs wanted to throw off their chains. Amazingly, yeah. quite happy with them and with the perks that uh, prime ministers and other party leaders extend to them. So that was a really sad development. But what the, the acts that party leaders hold over their heads is I won't sign your nomination papers in the next right. election. And if you try and override that by having your riding association executive say, forget it, we're going to have this person as a candidate, I will deregister the riding association executive and appoint my own. Uh, they also appoint the committee members. So if you want to just be a backbench MP with no responsibility, um, then you can easily be that person if by just getting on the wrong side of the party leader. Um, they, the party leaders also replace. If it looks like someone's on a committee and is going to stand up to something the government uh, uh, wants to do, then that day that person is not there because the party leader can replace any of the committee members, even just for one meeting. I've seen it happen again and again. Yes, uh, me too. And then all of a sudden that person's not on the committee anymore. And then on and on in terms of the penalties. So we need to free MPs. 
And if you free MPs, then they could be more like senators. They can be independent minded and representing voters, which I'm not saying senators represent voters because they don't have to, they're not elected. Uh, also, I think we should expand the number of seats outside of the big provinces so that inside the house as well, we bring more of the uh, equal representation, e e more equalized representation you see in the Senate of, of, across the country. And if you did those reforms, then you can shut down the Senate because you've brought the best parts of the Senate into the House. So it's not just about shutting down the Senate, it is a reform as well. Uh, the Senate, I just don't see it ever reforming itself. It's, uh, it's had more than 150 years and, you know, it, it had ethics rules first for senators in 2005. So that was just 168, or sorry, 100 and, uh, what is it, 138 years after the Senate was created. Finally just said, hey, you gotta give you gotta give them time, Duff. Start, you can't rush them. You gotta give them some time, right? Yeah, I just I don't see it. it, it there's pushback on every little thing to make it better. Yeah. And and it's an illusion that these are independent senators now. The old system of appointing senators was the prime minister would talk choose some people to talk to, talk to them, get a short list from them, and appoint senators. What happens now? Trudeau chooses some people for these so-called independent review committees who come up with a short list and then he chooses from the short list. He can actually, he doesn't have to choose from the short list. A lot of people don't know this. He doesn't have to listen to those so-called independent committees that he's chosen. Uh, he can choose whoever he wants to appoint to, to every Senate position. And so they're no more independent from the prime minister than they were. They're not part of caucus, but that doesn't mean that they still don't owe one person for their job. And when someone gives you a job for life, then psychologically, and this is another big thing why we have to stop gifts and big donations. Every study that's been done by behavioral psychologists around the world of tens of thousands of people from every culture shows the same pattern. The number one way to influence decisions is to give someone a gift or do them a favor. It's called reciprocation in the psychology literature. And uh, if you wanna look up a guy, Dr. Robert Cialdini, uh, I can provide the, the link to Dave to send it out to you. So when you go to a restaurant and they give you a mint after, uh, <laughs> and uh, if the server, that will increase your tip. If the server leaves your table, comes back and says, you've been such a great customer, I'm going to give you another mint, that will double your tip. These even small gifts, doctors get free samples from drug companies and they claim, right. no, these free samples are not for me. They don't save me any money. My patients, they save them a bit of money, but they're my patients. Uh, and they're just free samples. So, you know, one or two pills. Wouldn't change my prescribing practices at all. Uh, a York University professor, Dr. Uh, Joel Lexchin has studied this. Okay. Changes every doctor's prescribing practices. Wow. It's, it operates on a subconscious level. Right. You know, every culture has the saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Yeah. So if your lobbyist is allowed to give you a gift or fundraise for you or do any kind of favor for you, you feel guilty. You feel like you should return the favor. And, and as I've mentioned, they can do that in secret. And they can do a lot of it. And that's why they have a lot of influence. Anyone who can have a lobbyist in any capital across the country or at any city, city council, because they are whining and dining and building the, the account in their favor the guilt factor of the politician or government official who feels subconsciously obligated to return the favor and it corrupts decision-making across the country. It does, it's not just unethical, it is corrupting and yeah. it skews everything in favor of the wealthy interest. And in, in the US, the, the democracy movement has been embracing the word corruption as a, you know, um, umbrella term for, for legal, in, uh, elite influence of the system so yeah, we have they, they don't say we want reform they just say stop corruption and they they're not talking about cash in an envelope in a garage they're talking about the system being structured to allow for behavior that we should all view as corrupt it's like institutionalized corruption yes other than in quebec our political finance systems across country are a legalized bribery system okay it, bribery is I am giving you something, some benefit, money or some other benefit, a promise yeah. of a job. Yeah. 
And I'm telling you, you'll get this if you do this for me or if you don't do this thing. A lot of people ignore that inaction can help a lot of big businesses, especially, right? Voters are pushing for government re regulation of a corporation in some area. The, the politician doesn't do the regulation. That's a huge favor, only they didn't do anything. And a lot of the media are confused about this. They always say, well, what have they done for them? Well, they've done nothing, <laughs> but it was a huge favor for them. So um, we have a legalized bribery system yeah. because a political donation is they know you gave it and they know what you want. If you're a lobbyist, the head of the CEO of a company. So you don't have to tell them what you want. They know what you want. Right. And you are allowed at the federal level to give them thirty three hundred dollars uh, in most provinces, thousands and very few people can afford that. And it skews the whole system again in favor of the wealthy elite using money uh, again secretly with along with some secret lobbying to have undue unethical and undemocratic influence and it's no wonder uh, as we've said now for almost uh, 30 years democracy watch's slogan is the system is the scandal the system allows and encourages dishonest unethical secretive unrepresentative and therefore wasteful and abusive decisions and actions by politicians and government officials so why is anyone surprised that we have scandalous decisions and actions by politicians <laughs> and government officials? It's allowed, it's legal, and it's encouraged. The enforcement system, they choose all their own watchdogs. Almost none of them have the power to penalize anyone. If you break the fundamental transparency law in the federal government, there is no penalty. You're allowed legally to hire, hide information for years you're supposed to disclose it in 30 days. If you're caught, no one, there's no penalty at all. There's a report saying you should have disclosed it four years later. Ethics rules. If you make a decision that you profit from, as I mentioned with Bill Morneau, it's not only, that's legal. If you actually broke the, the ethics law, like I believe Prime Minister Trudeau did by taking part in the decision to grant We Charity uh, that grant. Right. Among many other examples, Ford has made a, almost every decision Doug Ford as Ontario Premier has made has been for a company that has a lobbyist to help him get elected or worked for him as a cab, uh, one of his cabinet ministers or him. And that is all legal, uh, except in, in some of the decisions, I think it's illegal, both the lobbying and the decision. But the penalty is just a report saying you broke the law. Politicians have imposed higher fines on people who jaywalk and park illegally than they have on themselves for breaking the fundamental rules that protect our democracy and require good government. So that's how perverse our system is. And, and if, that you, is if, you, that's... if you're wondering, do politicians really care about us? No, they don't. They, they've legalized bribery. They've legalized making decisions that are help themselves, their family and their friends. They've imposed huge penalties for relatively small things that citizens do in every sphere. They've required all sorts of people to be honest. If you're testifying in court, if you're an immigrant, a taxpayer, a corporate executive, you're, you're required to be honest, but not themselves. And they've imposed huge penalties for, for, for relatively minor legal violations on every Canadian uh, while imposing no penalties on themselves. They are self-interested. There's, the evidence is just so entirely clear that they are self-interested in protecting themselves from accountability. And uh, unfortunately, it goes across all party lines. None of the parties really take this seriously. We do a report card every election. The 2021 federal election, the Green Party had the highest uh, mark. It was C minus. That was the highest mark. <laughs> They're not taking this seriously. They all want power without accountability. So Duff, be dishonest, unethical, and secretive when they're in power. So, and that's why we all just have to keep pushing all together. Right. More more. That's where I want to go. So I want to spend the last few minutes really focused on the how, because um, as you just stated eloquently, and as Talene asked uh, in the comments, you know, how do we motivate politicians to bring in changes that are almost in conflict of, of their own interest? Um, Jack said, what do we do when politicians promise a reform and then don't do it? And Nick just says, Duff, how do we do it? <laughs> so um, if you could spend a few minutes talking about how you campaign, 
obviously you do a ton of research like for you to know that these decisions Ford is making relate back to people who lobbied him or a cabinet minister like that's not something you just see on Wikipedia like you this takes work you're doing a lot of great work but you need the help of other organizations and supporters and and donors and letter writers can you just describe the mechanics of what a victory looks like um, and the 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 40 people who are still watching right now and thank all of you, thank you so much all of you for joining us this evening. What can they do to turn the frustration they're all feeling right now into positive change? Well, just to remind people again, swing voters pay attention to this stuff. So that's that's 15%, 10 to 15% of the electorate. And 80% of Canadians want all these changes. So we have a lot going for us already. And politicians know this. And so the main thing is with opposition parties, if you're connected with them, trying to convince them to make this a major platform in the next election, because that will really threaten the ruling party. And the way they make it a major platform is they have to come out with it early. Gretchen came out six months before his election with his platform. Harper is uh, a month before, Trudeau four months before. They each had about 60 promises in their uh, platforms. And they highlighted it through the rest of the election and they were opposition parties in each case and they won those elections and the same goes across the provinces if you belong to any organization then urge them to to add this to their platform they have to join the coalitions that various democracy reform groups have have uh, done lend their voice um, send out action alerts to their supporters saying you should support this democracy reform because if we win it, it will help us win all the other changes. More groups need to take this seriously and lots of people are involved in lots of groups. So take it to the top of those groups and say, look, you got to spend time on this because you're, you're, you're not going to win these changes until there's open, honest, ethical and representative government. And it's very clear. There's a, tons of evidence of that. Right. Uh, everyone's chipping away and, and losing a lot of time. What do we do? We, we build coalitions. We spend time talking to those groups, convincing them to put some time and money and energy into pushing for these reforms, making submissions to committees when there's bills and signing on to open letters. Uh, every group, no matter what issue they're concerned about, should also be pushing for these reforms. And that's really the way to win, is convincing more and more groups to join the movement for democratic reform. Because if, if a if, even if the groups that work on these issues are few, if they each get 100 groups behind each issue and do an open yeah. letter, any politician seeing that will say, okay, here's 100 groups that are going to applaud if I do this. And some parties will switch and, and shift and see an opportunity. Uh, and maybe they're going to be lying with their platform, half the promises. True, uh, true, uh, Chrétien uh, broke half his promises, Harper broke half his and Trudeau has broken uh, half of his. But the half that they changes they made have made things better than they were in 93. No question at all. There's no possibility that a politician would be found guilty of the breaking the ethics rules back in 93 at the federal level. And Trudeau has been found guilty twice and, and several of his cabinet ministers. Things are better now. We've won 180 changes. And uh, so, you know, I also say to any individual, you have three friends who are not as active as they could be. And the movement needs to be bigger on every issue. So try and activate them. Just, just do three. If you do, if everyone who's concerned does, gets three friends active, then every uh, concerned group has three times the supporters all of a sudden. And a lot of them will be swing voters because people who are involved in groups are swing voters. They're looking for change and, and they're looking for uh parties that are going to address their concerns and so automatically if you're activating people and getting them in you're, you've added to the swing voter population and and then parties are more unsure in every election and looking for what will swing voters and they all know they're despite the fact they ignore these issues they all know that swing voters will swing to a party that promises to clean up politics seriously and repeatedly in any election campaign you have a newsletter. How, how, do people, how do people tune into your campaigns? Uh, you can join on the homepage, democracywatch.ca, join the Democracy Watcher Network, and you'll get action alerts. 
Okay. And uh, we have all the, the social media accounts, Facebook and Twitter, where we post regularly about the campaigns that are, that are, that are hot and in the news and with an opportunity to change. And, and we send out action alerts so you can easily uh, sign on and send submissions to government representatives. All of our campaigns, all of our 19 campaigns have an action alert on the page and you just click send and it goes to your federal politician, all the federal party leaders, your provincial premier and your provincial politician, as well as the key other politicians on committees at the federal level, just with one click. Amazing. So it's very easy to, to join and support. And of course, we welcome donations because that helps us keep the doors open and, and helps us build uh, all the coalitions that we want to do. And, and we also do court cases that cost a lot of money, uh, challenging bad decisions by these lapdogs who are not uh, being watchdogs for our interests, but are instead are protecting politicians from accountability. Amazing. Um, we have, um, oh, there's more coming in. Murray, will there be a summary of all the point stuff made this evening? There will be. I'm going to be sending all of you an email tomorrow with links and resources, et cetera. We had two questions from uh, Paul Grenier. One was, uh, how would removing tax credits help reform contributions? And then the second one is, could we have a grown-up conversation about politician pay? Which I'm guessing he's talking about municipal. I mean, there's a big wage gap between a rural councillor and a federal MP. Yeah. So why don't we do the first one first? Sure. Um, what is the relationship between removing tax credits and contribution reform? And then we'll go to the, the politician pay question. Sure, well, the tax credit is fairly egalitarian in that uh, it's proportional um, and you get more back for a lower level donation at the federal level. And usually the provinces match this they might have different limits, but federally you donate $200 to get 75% back as a tax credit. And then it scales down as you go up to the maximum amount, which is a $1,200 donation or so. Mm -hmm. However, um, you still get about half back of the 1200 and you have to have the 1200 in order to donate uh, in order to get that half back, the $600 or so. And so it still is skewed. I'm not saying it's entirely egalitarian, but it's 75% of the first 200 you donate. Uh, but again, those amounts, even $200, is way above what uh, an average voter can afford, and the stats show that. An average is $75. So, you know, there's lots of ways of reforming big money in politics, but our position is very, very firm that the only way to stop big money in politics is to ban big money in politics. And that means lowering the donation limit to $75 and uh, subsidizing uh, lower income people who can't even afford $75 right. uh, so that they can uh, be equal with others. And I'm actually doing my PhD in law on this su subject right now, drafting this part of my thesis. And it's the solution I've come up with is uh, is, is um, to have this subsidy for lower income and then public funding if the parties can prove they need it. I don't think the parties need more money. I think if they had to reach out to people at $75 each, that's the max that could be given, uh, then they would prosper if they addressed voter concerns. And if they didn't, they wouldn't get the donations. And why should they get huge subsidies otherwise? Uh, I can see subsidizing individual candidates um, with matching funding based on the number of people that, that donate to you and nomination race candidates. It's a big, big area uh, that's a barrier to effective representation. And nomination race candidates, I think, should receive public subsidies of funding uh, based on uh, the number of voters that they can sign up that support them, not even donors, just number of people you can sign up. Right. And what do we have now? At the federal level, you can donate $5,000 yourself to your own nomination race campaign. Well, who can afford to do that? Wealthy people. So it's all skewed in favor of wealthy candidates. So we need to make all of these systems egalitarian. Right. Formally, uh, not, not formal equality. If you've ever seen that classic uh, cartoon where people are standing on, trying to watch a baseball game over a fence on the boxes that are the same level. 
and, but they're different heights, so only one of them can see over the fence. We need substantive equality where the boxes are different heights to boost everyone up so everyone can see over the fence and participate in politics. It needs to be substantively egalitarian or we do not have a system that effectively upholds the fundamental democratic principle of one person, one vote. And if your system doesn't uphold that, then you're skewing it in favor of generally wealthy interests, which our whole system is. Um, Paul, can you elaborate on your question about... Um... Oh, I, I, I can take a stab at it while he types uh, something. No, he can just turn off his mic and go. Yeah. Oh, sure. Great. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thanks. Sorry, I don't know if you heard me when we were all introducing. I was a 15-year counselor in Niagara. And you know, we, we have a long chat about uh, ethics and uh, openness at the local level. I think it's baked in a lot more than it is at the upper levels and the need for public consultation. But the, um, I think a lot of the issues might uh, be there if we had fewer counselors and better pay right. uh, for people at the local level because it is uh, <clears throat> the, the temptation for corruption uh, exists is too great. And if we had better uh, representation for people taking the prime years out of their lives to do that kind of service, and it is, you know, not a lot of romance and sewers and sidewalks, but it is what makes the world go around. And we need to fix that disparity uh, on that. We have Mississauga counselors make as much money as MPs but you know, people in Timmins make you know, as much money as the parking pass for a Mississauga counselor. And so we, yes. need to, we need to fix that disparity and it would probably make a lot of those ingrained um, um, uh, accountability things work better. Yes, um, those are... Uh... Great points. Um, and, and to pick up on one thing you said at the beginning, and I should have mentioned another area of law in which we do have meaningful public consultation processes built into the law. Of course, there's always uh, advocacy for strengthening it is the Planning Act that, mm -hmm. that uh, affects municipalities and how they plan. And, and again, it's like the Environmental Assessment Act, it re does require meaningful public consultation, which again begs the question about why this is not in every law, why there isn't just a blanket law saying you're making a decision, you have to uh, do a meaningful public consultation in advance with a public report of what voters say. Uh, in terms of pay, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation goes after this all the time and says, oh, it's always too much, it's always too much. and. What is the magic figure? Um, you don't want people staying in office because it's the best pay they've ever had. They can never get another better paying job and they're totally detached from yeah. voters because they're paid so much. Uh, but you don't want it to be so little that one, they're tempted to try and get something on the side. And also lots of people don't run because they, they can't afford to. Um, so I, I favor uh, what was done at the federal level. Um, which was an independent commission. It's not quite as independent as it should be, just like anything that's called independent in politics is usually not really independent. When they say arm's length, I, I always say, well, arm's length, well, I can still reach out and grab you if you're arm's length away, so that's not far enough. So have an independent commission, do a study of what does this work? Yeah. And does this work, what's it equivalent to? And what's the average pay in that equivalent work? And that's what the pay should be. And it is at the federal level, and it's been matching that. Uh, in Ontario, there's been a freeze since 2012, I think, yeah. uh, or earlier, might, uh, might even go back further on pay for MPPs. And some people who live in high cost areas of the province literally can't afford to run now, even though they would want to. Well, they can't afford to win. <laughs> <laughs> they can't afford, afford to win. run, they can't afford to win. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so that's the way I think is the best way to do it. And um, just because you're in a rural area doesn't mean you should be paid less to be a city yeah. councillor than uh, sure. some cost of living adjustments can be made and uh, across the province. Um, but otherwise, I think uh, that's the way to solve that problem and, and have a mature discussion about it, put it out to an independent commission. Yeah, the other part about your circles and the the, the 
those that dispense the funding for interveners and help the interveners be there should be an independent court, um, yeah. body that would help people participate rather than that, because that's usually the barrier is the cost and the effort and expertise. Yeah. But if we had a way to assist people, provided they met a threshold, like I don't like it, it's not a good reason. But if they had a legitimate uh, life uh, type of um, affecting purpose, they should not be precluded from participation. And that happens a lot. It does. Uh, and, and every agency, board, commission, and tribunal across Canada is allowed to be chosen and structured. The people on it are allowed to be chosen and it's all allowed to be structured as an arm of the cabinet. Yeah. And that's... even even when they're enforcing laws, very important laws like human rights laws. And, and the Supreme Court of Canada made a ruling 20 years ago that said this was fine. They're allowed to be biased. The minister can choose people. They can choose friends. They don't have to be qualified. And it's undermined law enforcement across the country with every agency board and commission and tribunal, including an environmental assessment, where those boards get stacked and then turn away uh, interveners who have something valid to say. And that's part of having representative government is we, as I mentioned, we need an independent appointment system so that we have merit based appointment of qualified people. We will get much better law enforcement and much more representative decision making from all of these government agencies, boards, commissions, and tribunals if we have independent appointment systems and we don't have them anywhere in the country. Thanks, David. I think that we have a whole another session we could have about how the media plays it to make sure that people understand what they can and can't do and should be doing to be participating. And that would be fascinating to tie it into Duff's um, presentation. Thanks, Dave. Sorry about being so chatty. That's okay. This is all about being chatty. Um, tough. I, want, I, I have a, I have a, a question. Um, some of the reforms you've won, or at least some of the work you've done towards reforms, have happened in the court of law, where you, you're challenging something in court. Um, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if, if, if that's been effective. Um, uh, do you find that sometimes it's easier to win something through the judicial branch rather than the legislative branch, but also how do you afford, um, how does your organization afford to participate in legal proceedings and how do you fundraise and do you want to do a quick fundraising pitch to the, to the, <laughs> the few dozen people we have watching because I, I, I imagine that that is that there are costs involved with with challenging inequity uh, in the courts. Yeah, if, if I can just pick up on one point and then I'll answer that question. Uh, in terms of how to do this stuff, how to win and how to work with the media, what, what people can do as individuals. Um, building coalitions is one way. There's also a method of organizing it's called networked organizing, where you just encourage people to do whatever they can at the local level and facilitate that. And we do that as well. Um, and it's, a, it's another great way. And I think both have shown success and uh, even better when both are happening. There's little networked local events, protests or whatever, as well as large coalitions pushing. Um, in terms of the how, I also work with Democracy Education Network. It's Democracy Watch's charitable partner organization. And uh, if you go to democracyeducation.net and click on courses, you'll see a free uh, uh, civics uh, and active citizenship course. It has 40 uh, plus how to little brief one to two pagers on how to be an effective advocate in Canada, no matter what issue you're working on. Uh, and Dave will, can send that out uh, tomorrow as well. I'll send him the link for that. But just to, to note that and working with the media is very important uh, and having as many people uh, pushing the media to cover things and letters to the editor and writing op eds, et cetera, to get things out in the public eye because it amplifies it. Social media as well, obviously, sharing things uh, and posting yourself is all very helpful. When it comes to court cases, our record has been hit and miss. Um, the courts are generally very conservative in terms of how they interpret the law in, and in terms of um, going for an interpretation that would require parliamentarians and um, politicians to do something that they may not have put in one of the laws they've written explicitly saying that that uh, it should be done. 
even though if it might suggest it really strongly, the courts will often go on the side of, well, they didn't say exactly that that was the intent. And so we're not going to push them to that higher level. Uh, how we do it, we have been able to find lawyers to do the cases pro bono in almost every situation uh, since we did our first case now, uh, it was back in 2004. Wow. The cases we're doing are generally about a watchdog or a politician violating a law and the watchdog or the politician has said, this is how the law, this is how I interpret the law. And we're going to court and saying that's wrong. So there's no witnesses and there's not a lot of evidence. It's just a, an argument over what do these words mean on this page right. in this law. And so it's very inexpensive to do these cases. Uh, we just essentially file evidence as to what the words mean or the action of the politician violated what these words mean. And then the watchdog or the politician or government official files their arguments against. And so the trials are usually only half a day. And that's part of why we've had success finding lawyers to do it pro bono, uh, which in case people don't know means for free. The costs are, even if we lose, they're often not awarded because we're almost always challenging a law that has never been interpreted by the courts. And as a result, uh, the courts say it's in the public interest to have had this determined. And so everyone knows where the line is from this point forward. And as a result, uh, they often do not uh, award costs to the government or the government watchdog that we're challenging, even if they win and we lose. But it has been hit and miss. It's a good way of highlighting an issue though. And sometimes we win even though we lost. So we challenged the appointment of the Federal Ethics Commissioner and Lobbying Commissioner. The Trudeau cabinet handpicked them through secretive dishonest processes. And we lost. But what the court said was, of course the cabinet is biased when they're choosing this, but because of the Supreme Court of Canada decision that I mentioned from two, 20 years ago, they're allowed to be biased. So we won, right? as the court said, the cabinet was biased when they chose their own watchdogs. And we also won uh, highlighting that they're allowed to be. So obviously the law has to change so that they're not allowed to choose their own watchdogs because we know they'll choose lapdogs if they're allowed to choose watchdog, their own watchdogs. And uh, so um, even a loss can be a win. And we didn't have to pay costs because we had brought up a novel point of law that the courts felt was in the public interest to have determined. Amazing. Um, Marjan has joined us. Looks like she's a liberal candidate. Thanks for joining us. Hope you'll put some of these ideas on your, uh, your platform. Um, Duff, Thank got, you so I, much, I, I remember. Hey, Marjan, do you want to speak for a second? Oh, how are you doing? Oh, hey, good. <laughs> I was not prepared. <laughs> I'm actually really enjoying uh, the conversation and um, thank you for putting uh, this together. It's... Where are you? You're, it's light, you're either indoors or you're on the West Coast. Uh, I'm actually running for a rural Christmas Richmond Hill. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I think it, it is really, uh, it, it, the way actually we need to run the government we need to think twice on how we are doing it. And, and uh, one of the things that I um, hearing from the people is they are some, you know, sometimes you, you can see the people lose the trust on the, on the politics and the government. So it's, it's really great. These conversations that you, you have is amazing. And I'm, I'm trying to be with you guys, like, um, you know, for the next couple of uh, sessions that you're going to have and hopefully great, we can- thank you. I can increase my, my knowledge. Thank you Great. so much for doing it. Thank you. Um, thanks, Marjani. Good luck. Thanks. Um, I've got two more quick, I, I mean, when we started this at seven, I said, I don't think we'll go for two hours. And here we are creeping up on two hours, but there, there's more questions coming in and people are actually, jo people are joining the Zoom call who were done before my, my colleague, Alexi just, just uh, joined. Um, so two things, um, do, 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 where did it go? Where do they go? I wrote them some things down. And then I think I crossed it out. 
Mike wanted to know about cabinet secrecy. Did right. you mention something about that before? It's just one of the loopholes in the access to information law, and there's no reason for it. Um, it's the, one of the most abused loopholes. And some uh, people say, well, you won't get public servants speaking truth to those in power. Right. You do not allow cabinet secrecy. And I believe it's actually the inverse. Um, because it's all allowed to be kept secret, then um, they can't speak truth to power. They're, they're, because they can be sanctioned in secret for trying to do that. And it all ties into the whole system of the control and the control of employees and control of the public service. Uh, a lot of people don't know this. Deputy ministers and assistant deputy ministers are chosen by the cabinet. So they're at the top of the public service. Right. So what do you know, everyone below that, if you want to reach the top, what do you have to do? Because you know, to reach the top, you're going to have to please the politicians because they choose you. So right. it's a fundamental flaw in our system. There's lack of independence from our public service. And they, the deputy ministers and assistant deputy ministers are the one who decide the promotions of those below them. So they are chosen by politicians and then they choose to promote those below them. Well, what does that all add up to? A system that again, protects the politicians uh, from people who ask questions and challenge what the government's doing at the lower level of the public service. If it all had to be done in the open, then um, other than cabinet discussing, the, because every cabinet is made up of people from a political party. So if they want to have the discussion about what are the political implications for our party, fine. They could have that in secret. But the discussion of what information they received from public servants, right. which is now kept secret as under a, a loophole called cabinet advice or advice to cabinet, and the discussions they have themselves, um, all of that should be open. We should know all the information that they are receiving from public servants, all the studies that have been done in the government that all flow into this decision making process, combine that with a meaningful public consultation report. And then the public would be able to judge whether the government's doing what most voters want, what most experts say, what all the public servants say, uh, who are often experts in their field. And, uh, and they would be more accountable and we would get better decisions. That's one of the ways to get them. It's a key reform. All right, Duff, how's your energy? You got time for two more quick questions? Sure. Okay, Andre asked about judicial appointments. We don't have the same type of, um, uh, you know, high profile discussions about the politicization of, you know, like the Supreme Court appointments in, in the US. But as you pointed before, they are appointed um, by politicians What's your view about the politicization of judicial appointments here versus other countries? And are there any specific reforms you'd recommend? Yes. So here, you have to be a lawyer for 10 years to apply to be a judge, okay. provincially or federally. And then what happens is there are committees. Uh, and in Quebec, the, the government does not choose any of the members of the committee except for the judges that sit on it. But all the rest of them are private organizations. And that's the best, that's the best committee system. It's the most independent. And they review all the lawyers that apply and they rank them. And then they send the lists to the politicians. And the problem with that is they're sending long lists. Okay, so at the federal level for Ontario, maybe there's 20 lawyers that apply for a position that's open. Uh, uh, in Ontario that the federal government appoints. And so people know the provincial governments appoint the provincial court judges and the federal government appoints all the others, all the appeal courts, superior courts, as they're called, uh, court of Queens bench in some provinces, they're still called that. And so the, the feds can look at that long list of 20 lawyers and just currently choose the liberal lawyer that, that will rule in the way that the government wants, uh, rulings to go. And when the Harper Conservatives were in power, they could do the same. So the committee needs to be made more independent. Quebec has the most independent committee. Again, the, the cabinet minister, the cabinet does not choose any of the members, uh, except for the judges, the chief justice and things like that. But they were likely chosen by a different government because they would have been on the bench for a long time. And then the committee uh, in Quebec uh, sends a short list of only three 
uh, candidates, and the and the cabinet has to choose from those three. In the United Kingdom, the committee is chosen by the cabinet, so that's not good. But the committee only sends one name, and if the Minister of Justice says no, I don't like that name, the committee can send it back and say no, we really think this is the person. You know, the minister can say no a second time, but if the committee sends it back again, then the minister is required to appoint that person. So those are checks. Whereas federally, we have a long list of lawyers, all of whom are qualified because they've all been there for 10 years. And they can choose the least qualified one that aligns with their party uh, and ignore the most qualified merit-based appointee uh, that was recommended by the committee. And so that's why Democracy Watch has a, a challenge of the federal judicial appointments uh, system right now in court. The federal government's trying to get it thrown out uh, they brought a motion to throw it out, saying there's no case here. They're trying to throw out almost all the evidence as well uh, and, and say there's no case here. And what we're pointing to is there's lots of people, including the Canadian Bar Association, the largest association of lawyers in the country, lots of experts, academics who have said our system is too political, too partisan. Uh, we don't even have the check of the candidate that the cabinet chooses having to be approved by a, a, a committee. In the US, they have that, it goes to the Senate. And if the Senate's controlled by the other party, uh, uh, let's say the president's the Republican, the Senate's controlled by the Democrats, then at least you have that check on nominees, but we don't even have that. If, even in a minority government, the liberals can appoint uh, judges without any review by parliament. Uh, and so, and that goes right up to the Supreme Court. So uh, it's too political, our system, it's too partisan, and it undermines the public's confidence in the uh, impartiality and independence of our courts. And that's why we're challenging it in court right now. And hopefully uh, the court will say it will agree with us and essentially say to the government, you have to make changes to make it more independent, which would mean a shift more to like the system they have in Quebec and the UK kind of combined. Uh, those are the two best practice uh, systems in the world. All right, and then our last question was from Nick, who asked about just banning all political donations entirely and just publicly financing it. I mean, I guess you could argue that every um, campaign donation is a is a little bribe. But, you know, should any of us be giving money to, to politicians uh, openly? What What are your thoughts on that? So again, I'm doing my PhD thesis on this right now, and this is where I've come down on. Uh, I want parties to and candidates to have to reach out to voters okay. and uh, have them convince them that I'm going to do something for you and as a way of raising money. If it was all public funding, then I would still want it to be that you have to reach out to voters and you have to have them sign that they endorse you. And uh, then you would get the public money, right? But not without reaching out to voters. If a public funding system is um, like we had at the federal level and like we have in a few provinces, a per vote amount. First of all, what is the amount? How much do parties really need? Right. Should they have more money than what a voter is willing to give them? Right. Uh, a per vote amount could be there as a subsidy to uh, parties and candidates if they can prove they need it. Right. But you don't need any more money than someone you're running against or a party that you're running against. It's like a cold war, like they all need more because the others are spending more. Exactly. So, and we've shown that, right? Canada can run all of its elections, uh, all the parties run and, and they collectively spend less. All these parties and all these candidates spend less than uh, two presidential candidates, one presidential person running for president in the US. And why does that person need to spend that amount in the US? Because the other candidate is spending that. So we need to have a study of what amounts they actually need. If you lower it to $75 and you have a subsidy uh, for those who are lower income so that they can effectively donate $75, uh, then and you force the parties to reach out and you have a safeguard that the donation has to go to Elections Canada so they can verify it's your money, um, then uh, I think that's a, uh, the most egalitarian system with the right incentives so that parties still have to reach out to people, stay connected to them in order to receive the money. The problem with the per vote funding is you bait voters with a bunch of false promises like Trudeau did in 2015 with electoral reform. They vote for you 
And then you get money based on their vote right through the next election, even when you break the promises. So I think that was disconnected in terms of the accountability. Uh, they still got the money, even though they had lied to voters. And uh, so I, that's the system that I've come up with that's egalitarian, ethical, and I think democratic and gives the incentives to actually represent voters' concerns. And, uh, and that's what I think would work the best. Matching funding, I like as well, if you're going to have public funding. Yeah. So you raise a certain amount of $75, and I think there should be matching funding because someone may be supported by, let's say 10,000 voters, but each of them can only afford $10. And someone else is supported by uh, 2,000 voters, but they can afford $75. Well, we should do something to equalize the amount of money that those people end up with. So the more donors you have, the more matching funding you should get. And that I like as well, and Quebec has that. Quebec has per vote funding, and I would like to see Quebec with a world leading system eliminate the per vote funding and just have the matching funding, which they also have, and make it scalable. So you get more money for the initial amount you raise and less for the top end amount, and then people end up with roughly the equal amounts. And that would be, uh, I think, the best practice system right. that uh, would, um, would create all the right incentives. Great. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna let this go over two hours. I love that you're all still with us. Thanks, everyone. Um, where is your dissertation at? Will it Will it be shareable at some point? Indeed. Yeah, it? I'll be uh, defending it if all goes well in April. And um, just say one wrap up thing is you know we can't stop secret lobbying as I mentioned it's, it, and gov excessive government secrecy. There'll always be some of it. You can't get it at 100. percent There'll be the meetings in the underground parking lots. You can't stop bribery. If someone gives a bag of cash to a politician and they spend it slowly over the rest of their lives. No one's ever going to catch that. But we have so much of this stuff that's legal now that all sorts of people are not even discouraged from this bad behavior. They're encouraged. The system is the scandal and we need to clean up the system or we'll continue to see scandalous actions and decisions from politicians and government officials and everyone in politics across Canada. Thank you, Duff. Thank you for everything you've done. Thanks for joining us tonight. I have to ask one question. On your website, it lists a three-person advisory board, and one of them is a Ghostbuster. Yes, indeed. What's the backstory there? Dan Aykroyd, Canadian from <laughs> yeah. Ottawa. And uh, as I mentioned, I was a Nader's Raider. Ralph Nader, I worked for him as an intern. And uh, he, when we were starting up Democracy Watch, helped reach out to a bunch of people he knew from Saturday Night Live who were Canadians <laughs> because he had been on Saturday Night Live a few times through his career, as people may have seen over the years. And you can find them online, Ralph Nader on Saturday Night Live. Oh, wow. So one of the Canadians that he reached out to was uh, Dan Aykroyd, and he agreed to become an advisory committee member. He agreed with what we were trying to do. I love it. And I'm going to find those clips. I've, I've watched a lot of SNL clips and I haven't seen Ralph Nader. So I'll find those and I'll include yeah, them. In you, my usually don't, tomorrow. you usually don't, you, you wouldn't naturally search Ralph Nader in SNL, but <laughs> believe it or not, he was on multiple times because uh, he became a good friend of Lauren Michaels uh, over the years. And Lauren Michaels was very supportive of the work he was doing. Another Canadian in, right. in the US uh, pushing Americans to do better. Well, before you all go and start Googling Ralph Nader SNL, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, there'll be more events coming up in this series. It's a year-long series. Um, I'm going to send you links tomorrow. Um, I want you to check them out. Check out Duff's website. Sign up for his newsletter. Follow Democracy Watch on Twitter and Facebook. And when you go to his website, donation boxes open up asking to um, contribute to his campaigns. And I really want to encourage you all of you to do that because people like Duff and I, we can only do the work we do if people like you are supporting us. And um, the more independent we can be, the better. And the same way we don't want corporations funding candidates, um, we want to make sure that people like Duff are being supported by us. So make a donation to support the research and the advocacy that, that he's doing with his team. And um, just plug into Democracy Watch. It's the longest running and most effective de democratic reform group in Canada. And I'm so excited that he was able to be our second speaker in this series. Thank you, Duff.
My pleasure. And ha happy to answer any questions. You can email me from the site. And uh, and as uh, Davis mentioned, he's sending out some links of info. Happy to answer any follow up questions you have. All right. On that note, take care, everyone. Have a great evening, and we'll see you at the next session.